Hello, I'm David Hughes. Welcome to Your Perfect Body, the podcast of the esoteric teaching community. Today's selection is an essay entitled Nectar at the End. Everything that has a beginning has an end. We are born, therefore we have to die. There are no exceptions to this law. No one can live forever in this material world. The inevitability of death is something we all have to deal with. How will we meet death? Unconscious, shot full of painkillers, our life processes regulated by machines, violently in an auto accident, a plane crash or war, or peacefully, happily, gratefully and gladly. There is another saying, he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. In other words, we will probably die pretty much the same way we live our life. In the material conception of life, youth is wonderful, and old age and death are horrible. Nectar at the beginning, and poison at the end. This is because the material conception of happiness is based on sense gratification. In youth, there is ample facility for sense gratification, but this gradually dries up with age until at the end there is no material sense enjoyment at all only suffering. However, in the spiritual conception of life, the real source of enjoyment is the spirit soul. Just as the soul is the source of the life energy that powers the body, the soul is also the source of all pleasure and enjoyment. In material consciousness, this enjoyment seems to be coming from the senses, but the real source is the soul. Have you ever been in love? When, a, when you're in love, you experience great happiness and pleasure just from thinking of your beloved. Even when you're not together, you feel pleasure from your love. This pleasure is coming from the soul, and the proof is that the pleasure is present even when physically separated from the beloved. Of course, in material life, Love eventually loses its transcendent sparkle and becomes mundane. Why? Because we mistakenly identify the beloved as the source of the love we feel. As soon as our beloved misbehaves or otherwise fails to meet our expectations, we cover our warm loving feelings with judgment, which can even turn into hate. Just see the delusory quality of the material conception of life. Actually, the love we get so much pleasure from is coming from our real self, the soul. In spiritual life, our beloved is Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Since he is perfect in every way, there is never any reason for our love for him to end. In fact, unlike an ordinary person, the more we get to know him, the more our love for him increases, because he is a bottomless ocean of good qualities. Thus, by loving Krishna, we can experience the wonderful pleasure of transcendental love in any condition of life, young, old, healthy or diseased. Even on the brink of death, we can bask in the warm rays of spiritual love and be comforted by Krishna's personal presence. Instead of the greatest tragedy, death can become the greatest triumph, permanent liberation from material existence and suffering. But to achieve this, we have to live our life in such a way that we cultivate spiritual love from the beginning. This may be a little inconvenient when we are young, but youth is the very best time to begin spiritual life. In India, it is said, a saint in youth is a saint in truth. The older we get, 
the harder it is to change and develop spiritual habits. Therefore, begin your spiritual life while you are still young, even though it is difficult. Most people expect young people to be engrossed in material enjoyment, especially other young people. So to ignore the opportunities for the material happiness of youth to cultivate spiritual life often seems odd, against the grain, especially to your peers. Material happiness is available now, the logic goes, so one should take advantage immediately. But in spiritual life, the enjoyment is at the end. Or rather, one's spiritual pleasure just keeps on increasing, regardless of one's material situation. Everything spiritual is eternal and unconditional. Self-realization has nothing to do with one's material situation. So Krishna advises us in Bhagavad Gita, Yattara gre vishamiva pariname mritopamam tatsukam satvikam proktam atma buddhi prasadajam. That happiness, which in the beginning may be just like poison, but at the end is just like nectar, which awakens one to self-realization, is said to be happiness in the mode of goodness. Bhagavad Gita 1837 In the pursuit of self-realization, one has to follow so many rules and regulations to control the mind and senses and to concentrate the mind on the spiritual self. One must regulate eating and sleeping, become celibate, and give up all kinds of sense gratification. All these procedures are very difficult, bitter like poison. But if one is successful in following the regulations and comes to the transcendental position of consciousness, one begins to drink real nectar and one enjoys transcendental life in association with Krishna. Nectar, in Sanskrit, is amrita, which also means immortality. In the next verse, Krishna says, Vishayendriya samyogad yat tad agre mritopamam pariname visamiva tatsukam rajasam smritam That happiness which is derived from the contact of the senses with their objects and which appears like nectar in the beginning but poison at the end is said to be of the nature of passion. Bhagavad Gita 1838 A young man and a young woman meet and the senses drive the young man to see her, touch her, and to have sex. In the beginning, this may be very pleasing to the senses, but at the end, after some time, it becomes just like poison. They are separated, or there is divorce. There is lamentation, sorrow, or even death of one or both. Such is the inevitable course of so-called happiness in the mode of passion. Happiness derived from a combination of the senses and the sense objects is always a cause of distress, and if possible, one should avoid it by all means. Why? Because we are spirit souls, and any contact with the material senses is inharmonious with our real nature. We are meant for eternal, transcendental happiness, perfect enjoyment in relationship with God, Krishna. So the temporary imperfect enjoyment in this material world can never make us happy. And finally, Yadagre Chanubande Cha Sukham Mohanam Atmanaha Dindralasya Pramodhatam Tatamasam Udharitam And that happiness which is blind to self realization, which is delusion from beginning to end, and which arises from sleep laziness and delusion, is said to be in the nature of ignorance. Bhagavad Gita 1839 One who takes pleasure in laziness and sleep is certainly in the mode of darkness, ignorance, and one who has no idea how to act and how not to act is also in the mode of ignorance. For the person in the mode of ignorance, everything is illusion. There is no happiness, either in the beginning or at the end. 
For the person in the mode of passion, there might be some kind of ephemeral happiness in the beginning and distress at the end. But for the person in the mode of ignorance, there is only distress, both in the beginning and at the end. So by Krishna's grace, we have free will 